Hello. Welcome to Jules Says. I'm Julie Jules. If you have anything you'd like to share with me or with the listeners or ask me, you can email me at jewelsays at gmail.com or you can message me, DM me on Instagram. I do check that all the time. Oh my, oh my, the Lisa Laflamme debacle rages on. One article in the Globe and Mail, which is a Canadian publication for those of you who are not in Canada, Head of Bell says Lisa Laflamme dismissal not related to age, gender, or gray hair. Uh-huh. Okay. We believe you. I, I mean, if you say it, it must be true, right? Honest. And now Michael Melling is taking a leave of absence after CTV News journalists sent a letter to Bell Media executives expressing a lack of confidence in his leadership. Hmm... They were unwilling to reveal their names due to concern about professional retaliation. And there are other companies which have followed Dove Canada's lead with their own grey advertising. Sports Illustrated had already featured May Musk. Yes, she is the mother of Elon Musk. I had no idea. She's a 74-year-old model and dietitian and she was featured in Sports Illustrated on the cover of their May 2022 swimsuit edition. Of course, they took advantage of the noise over the last couple of weeks to pat themselves on the back for featuring a 74-year-old woman. Okay, that's great. I checked out some pics of her, and wow, she was and still is gorgeous. I had no idea who she was. I didn't know she was born in Canada. I'd never heard of her until Sports Illustrated got on the gray branding bandwagon. I hope I look like that when I'm 74. (laughs) Yeah, right, says me, who never looked like she ever looked, so it's definitely not going to happen. And I love her hair. It's a beautiful white platinum gray. Gorgeous. Unfair. It's hard enough for some of us to forgive ourselves for aging, but now that brands are embracing gray-haired women who are aging at least in theory, are we expected now to be old and beautiful? The whole point of the graying and aging argument is that we shouldn't be valued based on our appearance. (sighs) Enough, please. Well, it's that time of year when we send our babies off to school. Big babies off to college or university, little ones to preschool or maybe kindergarten or just elementary school. Maybe they're just going back. We all go through it. Well, unless you're homeschooling your children or have no children, of course. But even though all parents go through it, sometimes the big changes, the milestone changes can feel overwhelming. I remember an ad years ago for back-to-school shopping that depicted parents frolicking gleefully through the aisles to the tune of, It's the most wonderful time of the year, tossing school supplies with joyful abandon into their shopping carts. Hurtful for the children. By the time school starts, though, the children who don't have jobs or who aren't sent to camps or kept otherwise very busy, are usually bored. I never had a summer job until I was in my teens. But Abe and his five siblings worked every summer from probably about age five. They started out picking rocks. They graduated at some point to cucumbers. Driving the cucumber harvesting truck. I call it a truck, but apparently it was a small thing, small enough for a six-year-old to drive. I love this story about how Abe's brother Pete, yes, that's the same Pete mentioned in Catherine's show, Mrs. If you haven't seen it and you have an opportunity to see it, she's back on tour in the fall. Check it out. She's also in some other European countries, not just the UK. Last chance before she has another baby. Pete apparently walked off the job driving the cucumber truck. As I said, it was a small truck. He's probably big for his age. He's quite a tall guy now. But he he was only about six. And the family, apparently, they were on the back trying to keep up with it and harvest the cucumbers. They kept yelling at him about his speed, going off course, whatever it was. I quit, he announced and stomped off. 
I assume he was encouraged to get back to work. However, my goodness, those Latkemans, their work ethic is truly something to behold. Or I should say the Classens, because that is their mother's lineage, and I'm assuming they get their work ethic more from their mother than their father, based on what limited knowledge I have of the father. I bet the Latkeman kids really looked forward to the start of the school year. They probably needed a break. But apparently, they didn't always have the pleasure of enjoying the first day of school because they were still working. But that's another whole story. For another day, maybe. Me? I got bored by the end of the summer and really anticipated the first day of school with enthusiasm. What would I wear? Who would my teacher be? Who would be in my class? Of course, back in the 60s and early 70s, parents didn't entertain children and, well, at least mine didn't. And I assume since this aligns with the parenting depicted on the TV series Mad Men, based in the 60s, it was pretty standard. We didn't go to camps. We never went on holiday. Only short car trips to see our grandparents. I have no idea whether my mother felt any emotional uh, verklemptitude or anything when we went to school. I know she was upset when I moved out because I wasn't going to university. That was pretty distressing for her because she had to quit when she was 15. I worked with one guy whose children actually missed the first day of school one year. Well, the one year I know of because they just didn't note the date. They were in elementary school, too. Of course, he blamed his wife because she was a stay-at-home mother, but also the woman. But okay, I just don't understand how a parent could miss that day. It's kind of all over the advertising and in your face here. When mine went back to school, I was glad for the routine to resume. And I was also glad, if I'm honest with you, I was glad to be saving the money on childcare. But one of the challenges with childcare for elementary school age children is finding the before and after school care. I mean, who's around to do that? Their full time sitter, Val, who we loved, who I still love, had to get another job once the babysitting gig wasn't full time anymore. My mother had a job until she got sick. Plus, she had said when I was expecting Catherine, I raised my children and I'm not babysitting. And if you can't afford to quit your job when you have children, you have no business having them. So, yeah, that was out of the question. She wasn't available to babysit. I mean, she did and absolutely would have if I had an acute emergency, but it wasn't something that, you know, she wanted to do regularly. But I did actually convince her to do the after-school child care for a few months. I think it lasted a few months. I chatted with her on the phone every day, and I knew she was lonely. And I also knew she really wasn't well enough to just go out and about at the drop of a hat. I used to get her groceries every week when I got mine and bring them over and put them away for her. I thought the children would be good company for her, so I genuinely wasn't being 100% selfish about it. I thought it would be a win-win. They're so easy now, I said to her, and they were. They truly were well-behaved children. She didn't even have to make them food or anything. They can chat with you and, and play cards with you and get you things. My mom was usually stationed at what we affectionately referred to as Dorothy's Control Center, which was the kitchen table, always the same spot, a shelving unit behind her with her blow dryer, makeup, tissues, her phone, her cigarettes and ashtrays before she finally quit smoking, everything she needed within arm's reach. Anything that wasn't there, if she needed, she would call one of us to run get if we were there. I figured she could use some little helpers. The bus can drop them off at your house. You don't even have to pick them up or anything. They would just arrive and keep her company. They could make her food. They could get her drinks. So she relented. What I hadn't realized, though, was how unwell she truly was. In retrospect, I realize that now. 
So the arrangement didn't last, even though they really didn't require care. They were just good company. One of the summer babysitters told me it was one of the best jobs she had because she was being paid to just hang out with some fun people. That's how I viewed being with my girls. And I just couldn't understand it. It was still too much for her having people there every day, even though it was only a couple of hours, even though it was her own grandchildren. Having them there every day was draining. She just really wasn't well enough to deal with that. So yeah, back to school did present the after-school child care challenge. And at some point, I was able to start work late enough in the morning that they could be sent outside to wait for the bus before I left for work, which helped. I did make a point of starting late on their first day of school when they were little because I wanted to be there for that. And I must admit, it did feel scary, to say the least, putting a little wee three- and four-year-old on a bus. Joanne was only three when she started junior kindergarten, being a December baby, but at least she had Catherine to go with her. And, of course, Carrie had them both. And they were staunch defenders of their little sister. One of the things that really threw me for a loop was Catherine's grade 8 graduation, because I had thought of it as not a big deal. I mean, we all graduate grade 8, right? I couldn't understand why these girls were scheduling appointments to get their hair and nails done, their makeup done, buying fancy prom-level gowns. Hell, I was a grown woman, and I didn't get my nails and hair done or makeup for anything. I did that myself if I had somewhere to go. I ended up making Catherine's graduation dress. She chose the pattern and the fabric, and it was lovely and elegant and simple, a beautiful, mauvey, violet, light-crushed velvet, which I thought was nicer than some of the -the over-the-top, fluffy gowns. Some of them were very sexy. I was blindsided, however, with how emotional the actual graduation event was for me. It hit me uh, like a truck. Sure, everyone graduates grade 8, at least in my world, in our society, but the girls looked like young women when they dressed up. Catherine had been in the habit of wearing big baggy t-shirts and baggy jeans, and it was just a bit of a... A bit of a shock to see them all dolled up like that. They were beautiful. The speeches were beautiful. And the transition to high school was a big deal for them. They weren't all going to the same school, and it was very emotional and important for them. As I sat there, I felt so guilty for not being more supportive of Catherine's wish to make this a bigger deal. Her next big milestone, of course, was university or college. In Canada, we refer to degree programs as university and diploma or trade schools as college. I wasn't sure for a while whether Catherine really wanted to go to university, but I knew that she needed to go somewhere because she just wasn't happy at home. And I knew staying home would definitely not fix it. It would make things worse. I also knew that she was incredibly talented and very intelligent. She would get bored very quickly if she had just stayed. When the day arrived, I borrowed a truck from my friend and colleague, Vic. Catherine and I packed up the truck with her furniture, belongings, school supplies, and a desk I had bought and planned to assemble when we got to her new place— It took up a lot less space unassembled. She was renting a bedroom in a single woman's home. This woman would have been a little older than I am, but it was handy. It was a short walk from the Ryerson campus in Toronto, so a good place to start. And off we went. Side note, Ryerson is now called Toronto Metropolitan University. Egerton Ryerson was instrumental in the design of Canada's racist, horrific residential school system, so his name needed to go, because we no longer want a society that commemorates 19th century colonial overlords. 
Doing this podcast reminds me how shite my memory is at times because I remember some things so well and other things are just a blank. And I don't know if that's because they were emotional or if it's just because I was tired. But anyway, I don't remember much about the drive there. We got to the house, unloaded her furniture, all her stuff, and unpacked everything, put it all away. We walked around the neighborhood, and I bought her some groceries and a few things she'd need. We set up her bed and assembled the desk, which took me longer than I had thought it would. Oh, God. Whenever I assemble furniture, I just assembled a new desk for myself because I need a stand-up desk. I'm going back to IT, so I finally got one, just assembled it yesterday. It took me longer than it should have, but... I meticulously follow the step-by-step instructions, which can be quite time-consuming. Plus, uh, yesterday I had just gotten home from an eye exam, so I actually couldn't see properly. But on this particular day, I assembled the desk. I I always finish something and think, well, if I had to do that again, it would take me half the time. When that was all done... I left for the three-plus-hour drive back to Sarnia sometime after about 4 a.m. I had to be at work by 8, so I drove straight to work. And I felt bereft. I'm not exactly much of a crier, but I cried as I drove home that night. Catherine, Catherine was my best friend when she was little. And maybe it isn't healthy for your little girl to be your best friend, but pretty much if I wasn't working, for the most part, I was at home. And I spent so much time with her, reading stories, lying in bed beside her, listening to her, telling me about her day, what she was thinking, her ideas, how she felt about things. She was always just so creative, articulate, analytical, and expressive. It's no surprise that she grew up to be so insightful and such a good writer. And that was my relationship with her until it all just dried up. I was shut out and though I understand that it has to happen, it would be weird if your children didn't outgrow you and move on with their own lives. And just like that, she was gone. Part of the reason I felt so sad was because the last couple of years had been pretty hard, and I wasn't sure if she would ever forgive me for my role in making it harder in some ways. I mean, I didn't try to make it harder. We all do our best. I had been doing my best, sincerely trying to get it right, but in many ways, I did make things harder for all of us. So that was tough. Joanne's move to London, Ontario, was closer, just over an hour. And I'd been through this before. She was my second. So you would think I would have been better prepared, emotionally anyway. But she was only 17. December baby. Moving into a townhouse with her boyfriend and some other guys. I wasn't a fan of the idea of her living with her boyfriend. Definitely absolutely nothing to do with morality. But I know firsthand how much harder it is to extricate yourself from a relationship when you live with the person. One of you has to move out. Maybe things get to a point where you're not safe there or you don't feel comfortable there. Maybe you have nowhere to go, and you can't just say to someone, fuck off and go home, if you share the home. It's difficult enough for adults, never mind a teen. So that was my concern. And never mind when you're trying to study for your degree. This is why I have a three-year rule, although in her case, I'm pretty sure she had been seeing this guy for over three years. But she was so young. When you're 17... I know you don't think you're as young as you are. I thought I knew it all when I was 17. I moved in with my boyfriend when I was 18, and that definitely made it harder for me to extricate myself. But you can't tell them what to do at that age. All you can do is love them and support them and hope to hell they don't have a baby too soon or get killed. 
The night before we were set to go, Joanne asked if we could drive a friend of hers to his dorm as well. He was also going to university in London. Ah, seriously? My first thought was that I wanted the drive to just be the two of us. Selfish, I know. Doesn't he have parents who can take him? No, Mom, he doesn't. Remember, he's Carrie's friend's older brother. Oh, well, I felt like a pile of shit then. I knew the story of Carrie's friend. Her father had died in a car accident, and her mother had died of cancer a few years later, when this little girl was only about 11. So her brother might have been 13 at the time. Carrie and I had discussed the possibility of her friend living with us at one point. I told Carrie that if she did come to live with us, though, and they had a falling out, We would have to sort it out because if she came to live with us, our family had to become her family unconditionally. I don't think we ever ended up talking to her about it. Whatever the issue was, she resolved it at home and ended up staying wherever she was. But yeah, I was well aware of the situation. But I hadn't realized that Joanne was friends with her older brother. In Joanne's case, we didn't have furniture to move, and it was a short drive, so easy. I didn't need to borrow or rent a truck. We headed out to pick up her friend, who I had never met, or if I had, I hadn't recalled meeting him. He was so cute. He was just a sweet-looking, handsome little guy. When I say little, I mean young. I met the family he was living with and helped him with the few bags he had packed. He asked me if he should bring his suit. Yes, I said. You never know when you'll need a suit. He scurried off and returned with it on a hanger. I just thought he was adorable. This was my first and only experience with a dorm situation, though, because my girls all ended up renting apartments or rooms somewhere. As we entered, we were greeted by several student volunteers, dorm veterans, all smiles, They were great. Whose mother are you? Ugh, I felt so badly for him as I gave the volunteer his name. We were directed where to go. More volunteers greeted us at the door with carts to load everything up. It was really a happy, exciting, convivial, supportive atmosphere, almost like a big party, the move-in day. We were surrounded by families, parents, siblings, some grandparents, all there to support their beloved children on this monumental day in their lives. I had often felt alone because I was alone at recitals, shows, graduations, confirmations. Although Ted did show up at Joanne's confirmation, which surprised me. I ran into him out in front of the church, and (laughs) I said to him... (laughs) You have to know Ted. I said to him, oh, come and sit with me. And he just kind of, he wouldn't turn his head. He would just kind of look at you with side eyes. And he just went, and then he walked away from me and went and sat somewhere else. That's Ted. But at least he showed up. When she gave an invitation to her confirmation to one of my brothers, or it might have been her grade eight graduation, I forget. Anyway, he said, Aw, honey, it's a Friday night. I'm not going to be able to go. I'll be drunk by then on a Friday. Part of his charm, I guess. So yeah, I had often felt that my children missed out because they didn't have the support of extended family that a lot of other people seemed to have. But this boy didn't even have his mother. It punched me in the gut. I couldn't imagine how he must have felt in these situations. I don't imagine you ever quite get used to it. Joanne and I went up to his dorm room with him and helped him bring in his stuff. His roommate had not yet arrived. Do you need anything? I asked him. We can go pick up anything you need. Supplies, snacks, want to go out for lunch before we go? Are you hungry? No, thank you. I'll just unpack. I'm sure there will be things going on here later. Okay. I looked at him and smiled. And I know I was nobody to him, but I felt terrible leaving him there alone. I'm going to miss you, I said. What an idiot. We both laughed and he let me give him a big hug. I've never seen him since. 
But I have since heard from the girls that he graduated and is very successful and doing well, which makes me happy. Now, I'm not exactly a crier, but I had a hard time driving through the tears after that one. We headed to Joanne's townhouse and moved her stuff in. You know, I I just had to accept the situation. And I don't remember anything about that day after. Carrie's move to school was in the middle of winter, December. She had been accepted to the Fiorio Beauty Academy and was renting a room with a couple of other girls in a divey little apartment above a shop. Just bedroom furniture and belongings, a few kitchen things to move. I rented a van this time. She and I loaded everything up on an excruciatingly freezing sub-zero day in December, and off we went. The flat was in Roncesvalles, a Toronto area on a fairly busy street with parking challenges. It was pitch black dark, even though it wasn't even late when we got there. Our days in December are ridiculously short. It was an old building with a very narrow, steep staircase up to the apartment. Walls on both sides, so absolutely no leeway at all for anything that might not fit. We struggled to move everything up. Our hands were frozen. There wasn't much light in the place. It was old, small windows. Her room was tiny, but we got everything set up, unpacked, then went out for groceries. I remember cleaning the bathroom. It's sometimes hard to get an old bathroom with old fixtures and tiles really clean. One of my little peeves. My only recollection of that trip home is the emptiness of that van. When you're driving one of those vans and there's nothing in it and the the rear end of it is kind of bouncing along, you can hear the emptiness. So yeah, and that was it. All three launched, on their way without me. It was all up to them. I had done my best. I had made my mistakes. But they were fine. Now it was time for me to plan my own move. Thank you for listening. I really like hearing from you, and the listeners might appreciate hearing some of your stories too. Email me at jewelsays at gmail.com. And if you're moving anyone out this week or you have little ones starting school, they'll be fine and you'll be fine too. Have a wonderful week.